Samozřejmě to je spíš, jak aby jsme trochu donutili se ptát. A jo, jo. A... Myslím, že nebude čas na otázky stejně. Jo, a když občas koukni sem, kdy ukážem 10 minut do konce, 5 minut do konce, mm. konec času. Jo. Dobrá, jo. dobrá. A kdyby byla nějaká otázka, tak musím tě zopakovat mikrofon. Jo, no, dobrá. když budeš někde tady poblíž, tak ten mikrofon to chytá, tak mě utíkej moc daleko. Jo, jo. No, to celkem prý zvládá. Jo. jo. OK, tak asi vím všechno. Podu. Já jsem si ho nepřinesl, ale jestli nějakou máte, tak si vezmu. Ne, za tady možná už je po někom, tak raději vytáhni další. Ať si nekontaminujeme přednášející. Tak jo. Co ještě něco? Nebo chceš něco vědět? Nebo... Asi ne, čeče, asi už všechno. A ty děláš tady prvně? Ne. Ještě chvíli, jo, půjď mi potom hlavně nevyrazit. Chystáš se udělat něco jako kontroverzního, nebo tak? Jo, mě by to nějak představovat, nebo se vám představit celá hlubu. No, záleží, jak chceš ty. My standardně řekneme, my standardně řekneme další přednáška je o tomhle a má i tenhle člověk, přivítejte, zatleskejte. Ale jestli chceš něco víc, míň, na tobě. Je mě znám prostě jednou. Spíš méně než víc. Dobře. Jako, že ho přece mluvit o jinom člověku je takové trochu divné, zvláště když stojí vedle. Vy třeba přijde na přízí, je to přednáška o něčem a bude to přednášet tenhle ten človíček a jmenuje se třeba Jirka a prostě... Jo, jedem. Put! Dobrý jdem. Dobrý jdem si tak člověk nemusí jít s tím jasným. To tady je. Jasně, no. Ještě to není zapíš, ne? Já myslím, že je to zaplet celou dobu. A to pak někdo bude snad stříhat, takže... Přepnu do slušného mluvy. Je to právě, jo, ta To se to, to se streamuje, to se ty ukládání. Ukládat se to bude určitě, ale možná, že je to i streamované přímo na nějaký YouTube kanál, něco takové, takže nevím. Kolika to máte dneska? Kolika to je? Já myslím, že snad do šestky, nebo tak nějak? Ne, myslím, že tady možná je to jen nějak kratší dobu, ale oni pak jsou ještě ty Lightning Talk. Jsou takové ty jako desetní minutovky, typicky jako něco mě zaujalo a dělám něco podobného, tak jako bych to shrnul a řekl, prostě koho to zajímá, ať se přijde podívat. Takové rychlovky. Ale myslím, že poslední, poslední prezentace jsou do šestní. To už budu Se váš. <laughs> tak zítra je party, ještě to určitě víš. Jo, jo, jo. Jsem tak dobrý. <laughs> to bude otravovat, tak bude. <laughs> Kolik radostí udělá světilku za pár korun. <laughs> A jim s tím moc to, že vidět, jak se mi třeba srka. Proto to tady už je ten používat to už můžete vtyč, jo? Tady je těžší, to... tak se to řekne to, no musíš zabrat. <laughs> to je jen 40 minut. 40 minut, 40 minut všetně otázek. Takže vy mě nějak ukážu. 10 minut, 5, 10 a auto time. A pak už přijde s tímhle tím klackém a... Dobrá, dobrá. Jasně. Jak bude out of time, máš tak půl minuty na to, co a potom tě vytáhneme. A spíš takhle, jak ti lidi se baví, tak to nezavází ten člověk, tak je to jedno, ale pak... Jo, a pak ještě ti asi dáme flešku na ty slidy, jestli nám to můžeš dát. Zkušenost je taková, že když to toho člověka vytáhneš hned, tak je to v pohodě. Než pošli to prosím sem, tak už to nikdy neuvidíš. Jo, Okay, so hi, my name is Jiří Olša. I work for Red Hat. I maintain Perf for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and I work for Perf in upstream. This presentation is about how can you use Perf uh, to profile the memory. It's not the complete set of the Perf uh, features um, that help profile the memory. It's just some new uh, new features. I will start um, with some basic topics like describing uh, what we have in the memory cache and 
how it actually works. Then I will go through some um, basic events and um, I will go into more detail about uh, kind of new features that were introduced lately. First is CQM and the other is uh, C2C. A uh, little disclaimer uh, in the beginning, I will be talking about the caches, about the hardware, and everything I will mention about the hardware is connected to x86 architecture, and namely to Intel CPUs. I will also show some examples of the perf, but not everything is in the upstream, so if you actually want to try and use uh, whatever I will show today, uh, you better uh, download uh, the source uh, of the perf from this git tree and from this uh, perf core branch. And there's nice how to about how to install perf from sources. Okay, let's start uh, with the basics. So there's a memory in the CPU and it's the device that stores the information and it's the one that stores it uh, temporarily and it looks like this, well, it used to. The problem with the memory is actually the speed and that it cannot keep up uh, with the current CPU speed. And that's why actually we are interested in profiling memory accesses because when there's a stream of uh, instructions going through the processing unit, the access to the memory, if it's load or store, it actually adds the latency if it needs to uh, go to the main memory. And that's something that perf can actually help a bit. So main memory is slow compared to the CPU, so the uh, people came with a small memory in between the CPU and the main memory, and it's, uh, and it's the small memory that's called cache. So it's a smaller memory, it's faster. So CPU is uh, going to this cache memory instead of going to the main memory. If there's a case, the data is not in the cache, you need to go to the main memory. And if you load the data from the main memory, you load it not mm, byte by byte, you actually load uh, in the cache line sizes. That means for Intel it's 64 bytes. So you go to all 64 bytes uh, to the memory. There's a, uh, actually the caches uh, completes a hierarchy. So there's not only one small cache. Uh, in nowadays CPUs you will have the hierarchy of the caches. So the first level, really small, really fast memory. Uh, then you have second level and several other uh, levels. And each level the memory is getting slower and higher, but still it's on the same place as the processing <coughs> unit is. So the speed accessing the caches is actually much faster than you go to the memory. How it look actually the cache hierarchy in the real life? It depends, it varies from architecture to architectures. Here you can see some uh, latest uh, Intel microarchitectures, Haskell, Brogdell, Skylake being the latest one. And basically you need to know what CPU are you running, then you confirm the Intel software developer manual or the optimization manual. And there you can find out what's the cache hierarchy, what levels of the caches and sizes you have in your, in your CPU. Most of the time you will, just, you will get this, this picture. You will get, so you have socket, that in within the socket you have several cores. That depends, you can have quad cores or any, any number of cores in the socket. And the cores, uh, each core has a separate cache. A dedicated cache uh, level one and level two, and all cores in the socket share the last level cache. In this case, is it's level three. So this is like the most common picture you'll actually get. How you can find out uh, what was the topology of the CPU and the caches that you actually uh, running on? You can use the perf report. 
because anytime we store the data to the perf, uh, perf the data file, we store also the information about the CPU topology and cache topology. So you run perf report dash dash header dash capital I, and you will get all the information that is actually needed to get the, um, some information about the topology. So here you can see uh, the topologies of the CPU, so CPU8 having core ID number two, socket ID number one, and the, the rest of the picture is the topology of the caches, so you can see what level one caches, how many level one caches you have, and what CPUs actually share those caches. And for example, level three here is shared by the, by the socket. So this is how you can actually uh, from the data file that per store, you can find out what was the what was the topology. Does it contain the NUMA topology as well? Okay, so the question is if it does contain the NUMA topology. It is there. Uh, it just didn't fit in the picture. So we have it. Yeah. About the sizes and the speed. So this is the last, well, the latest uh, CPUs from the Intel and. That's basically uh, common sizes and speed for the level one and level three caches is what you can see. Uh, level three basically differs from CPU configurations. It can be like two megabytes or several tens of uh, megabytes. Four cycles being the uh, speed for the level one is quite common. Uh, if you go uh, to level two, level three, it gets higher as you can see, and if you go to the main memory, it can be even hundreds of cycles uh, latencies. Before I go to, the, to those features that I'm going to introduce, just a quick picture about very common, very common events we have in the perf that actually helps you to profile uh, the caches. If you run perf list, just grab for the cache and you will see all the events uh, that deals with the caches. So cache misses, cache references will get you the numbers of the last level cache, and the rest of these events are self-explanatory. You will get the events for D cache, I cache, anything you want to measure, actually. OK, so those were the basic. Now about the first feature. I want to talk about uh, cache quality of service uh, monitoring. This feature was introduced on Intel CPUs. Uh, uh, it started on the Haswell microarchitecture, and it basically gives you idea. Uh, it helps you identify how the program or the entities you monitor is using the last level cache. And it can give you the occupancy, like how many megabytes some item is using in the last level cache, or it can give you the bandwidth, like uh, how many megabytes were taken from the main memory to the last level cache. At the time, only the first part of the feature is implemented. So we have only one event, which is Intel CQM LLC occupancy, and it gives you, it gives you the occupancy for, for the workload you are measuring the occupancy of the last level cache. How it actually works is the CPU has the shared, that there's a register for each CPU that you can fill with the ID. And you assign the ID to workload you want to monitor. So let's say it's a process. Uh, so each time the process gets scheduled on the CPU, uh, the CPU takes all the stores and loads from the last level cache with this ID. And later on, you can query uh, this feature and get the data from the last level cache, how many bytes were accessed by this entity. And that's actually what you can do with the perfstat. If you run perfstat uh, like this, you monitor the LL occupancy event, and you monitor dash, you use the dash A, uh, for the system wide and dash capital A for the aggregation per CPU. You actually get the output of uh, how many bytes 
R star for each uh, CPU in the last level cache. Another, another example of usage for this is uh, you can monitor the workload that you can specify as a standard workload for stat, uh, stat command. So it will also give you the output of how the last level cache is used during, during this workload. And last example, it's also possible to attach this event as any other event in the path to the running process, and it will give you the idea how the process is using the last level cache. The other part of this feature, the memory bandwidth used, uh, it's not done yet. The last version was posted last year in the June, so we are still waiting for for a new version to come. Okay, that was the CQM monitoring of the last level cache. Uh, the other feature I will talk about is C2C. That stands for cache to cache. It's actually not that new. It was introduced like two years ago, something like two years ago uh, by Richard Paulus, Don Zikos, and Joe Mario. Uh, at the time, it, it didn't get to upstream for some reasons. Now we are trying to uh, slowly push it to the upstream, and we have a new version of this tool that hopefully will make it upstream very soon. And all the examples I have today for this tool are from the, from the new tool that we are now uh, developing. OK, so what does C2C actually do? Thus, it actually uh, monitors the loads and the stores, and it gives you the idea of the cache line contentions during your workload. <coughs> this is actually very tightly connected with cache coherency, so I will go and explain a little bit about the cache coherency, cache coherency details. So let's explain on the example. Let's say you have this uh, setup with two CPUs, each having its own cache and sharing one memory. And each of them is accessing variable A. If we have CPU 0 accessing uh, variable A just for reading, the memory will get loaded to the CPU 0 cache. Now we have CPU 1 storing to the memory to the variable A. So the memory will get loaded to the cache of CPU 1, and it will be changed to number 2. Now CPU 0 again wants to read the memory. So this is the problem for the cache currency, what value it should actually get, and uh, actually what cache currency handle is that it will ensure that whenever the program is accessing uh, the memory in the cache, it will, get, it will have the latest value, so it will somehow ensure that uh, the new update from the CPU 1 will get to the CPU 0, and the program in the CPU 0 will get the latest value and not the stale value uh, it has uh, before. How it is implemented? Uh, so cache currency is implemented in the hardware. There are several ways to implement and the cache currency. Intel is using something which is called snooping cache. That means that each CPU in the cache can actually see all the traffic, all the messages on the shared bus. So anytime any CPU wants to change something in the cache, it shouts on the bus, I am going to change this and this, and all the other caches actually see this and behave accordingly. And the other part of this snooping cache is that for each cache line, actually we hold three states, modified, shared, and <coughs> invalid. And so together with this state for each cache line and the messages on the bus, it actually completes the state machines and the transitions are the messages on the bus. And well, yeah, that's how, that's how cache lines are maintained within each CPU. Let's explain. Let it be explained on the example we have. So same story, CPU1 reading the memory. 
the CPU one, when it's reading the memory, it shouts on the bus, I want to read this cache line. CPU one, see this message and just doesn't care because it doesn't have this cache line loaded in the cache. Now, step two, CPU one uh, is changing the memory. So it shouts on the bus, I'm going to route, write to this memory. CPU zero sees this message and it can see, okay, I have this cache line loaded. I need to do something about this because CPU one is uh, going to change this. So what it does, it moves the cache line to the invalid state and CPU1 uh, loads the memory and change it and mm, put its cache line to the modified state. And the last line, CPU0 reading the memory. Again, it says on the bus, I'm going to read this memory. CPU1 sees this message and say, okay, I need to do something. I have this memory loaded in my cache and it's modified. So with what it actually needs to do, it needs to store the data of variable A back to the memory and CPU zero after the load uh, this memory to its cache. Yeah, I will, I will get to it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so this is just the basic uh, basic MSI protocol. I'm not sure if it was um, ever actually used in some CPU, but all the all the other uh, uh, currency protocols or cur currency mechanisms that are used nowadays are in Intel are based on this MSI, and they are actually using some extended extended uh, version of this uh, MSI protocol. And uh, this extended means that there are some extra states. And these extra states actually allows to not to complete, uh, like there was a question if the memory needs to go to the main memory. It allows the value to be forwarded through the bus. It doesn't need to go to the memory. So they are somehow enhanced versions of this MSI, MSI protocol. Uh, but the idea is the same. Uh, and it's good, it's good to know what's behind because with just uh, very simple access to the variable, you can cause a lot of traffic on the memory control and on the bus. And that's why, that's why uh, memory profiling is <laughs> important. So the cache currency is also behind, uh, behind uh, false sharing, which is actually performance, performance issue and the issue, uh, the point of the issue is that in the one cache line, you store two variables. One cache line is 64 bytes, so very easily two variables can, can fit in. So if we, if we check the latest example, if you have the variable A and add another variable Z, and we are in the state that CPU1 has uh, the variable A, the cache line with the variable A in the modified state, and another CPU comes in and says, okay, I want to read the variable Z, which happens to be in the same cache line. What will happen? The CPU2 again shouts on the bus, I am going to read this variable, CPU1 sees, but I have this cache line in my cache, so I need to do something about this. So it needs to mm, store the data back to the memory update the memory, and after that, CPU2 can actually, can actually uh, use the cache line. So just to see that separate, separate process uh, accessing unrelated variable can cause uh, a lot of traffic and a lot of latency in uh, other two processors that actually have uh, nothing to do with the Z variable, and that's what's false sharing about. So this is the issue. This is the issue that C2C tries to address, tries to help, uh, tries to help profiling. And what do we have to actually monitor this? Uh, we have two basic events uh, that were introduced uh, quite a long time ago: memloads and memstores. It is like uh, each 
each uh, event in the Perf system, you can measure the event or you can sample the event, but it is a little bit more enhanced and it provides additional data. First, it provides the virtual address. So anytime you're going to load or store something in the memory, you will get the virtual address, which is good because that's what we are going for. Next, you can say actually the latencies for the loads that you are interested in. So let's say you are interested in this example only for latencies which are bigger than 30 cycles. And it will give you only, only the uh, loads that are that actually fit to this uh, criteria with four cycles being as a minimum number. And the third thing is actually the data source, the, the history behind the load. So, uh, it will actually tells you, okay, you have this load instruction and you get sample from this instruction, but how the data got back to the CPU cache? Was it because we hit L1, L2, L3, and if we, if we didn't hit L3, what happened afterwards? If we went to the bus, if we saw this cache being modified in some other processors, so uh, this, was, this is probably the most costly case that you hit you want to uh, load something which is loaded somewhere uh, in some other CPU and it's modified. And we have the same uh, for the stores. Uh, as with everything, it's not that simply simple. Uh, you will not get all the loads or all the stores. The Intel software developer manual for these events actually says it will randomly select loads and stores that uh, you, will, you will see in the, uh, in the final, final data. So you just need to keep it in mind that you are not getting all of it, just some random, random subset. In addition to load latency events, uh, there are data LA events. It's kind of the same as the load latency. Uh, it doesn't uh, uh, allow you to specify the latency for the loads, but in a sense it's the same. Uh, for each data source, there's separate event, and you will get the you will get the data address of, of the load or, or the stores. Okay, so we have the problem, we have the events, and C2C combines all this together. It provides the record and report comments. So to monitor the workload, you just run parse C2C record and your workload. And you can use actually any modifiers that you would use for normal perf record. Report is the main guy that does all the job. It loads all the data, all the stores, and all the loads, and sorts them by the cache line. And the cache line are sorted based on the uh, most costly uh, excesses. So at the, at the end on the screen, you will see data sorted by the cache line, and you will see the most most costly excesses. I will show you the, I have like three examples prepared. First is uh, made up one, just to, we already know there's an issue and I will show you what uh, C2C will actually display. And the other one are like from real world, actually identifying some false sharing issues in the kernel. Okay, so first the simple one, imagine, you have shared structure between, uh, between two uh, processes which are, which are meant to be run only on uh, separate CPUs. And one is storing to variable B, the other one is loading from variable A, and variable A and B happens to be in the same cache line. Uh, you can use actually this very nice tool, Payhole, if you specify um, on the binary and says what structure are you interested in. It will show you the binary output of the structure. And if its structure is bigger than this example, it will show you the assignments of the cache lines within this structure. So it's very, very helpful for uh, identifying those issues. So I run the perf C2C record <coughs> on this guy and what I've got, if you run perf C2C record. Among other things, you actually see that 
the first one is this cache line. As you can see, it's still work in progress. Most of the time, uh, we see only uh, the addresses. If you are lucky enough, you will see the data symbol. So this is the basic input output of the report, C2C report. First, you will see the sorted uh, cache lines. Then you will see the data symbol, <coughs> if there's a luck and you will have it uh, translated. Then there's a total number of records that were actually, that belongs to this cache line. And then you will see the data about the data source. So you will see, uh, you will see that there are some stores like here. There were some loads like here. So this is, this is just the basic output and you can actually navigate through the cache line you want to see and press D, like for detail. And you will see uh, the whole cache line, actually the offsets of the cache line and the way uh, the cache line was accessed. So we know because it's made up in example that we have one structure with two variables. And from this output you can see the first variable ended up on the offset 16, the other one on the offset 24. And one is being stored to, it's the other one. And the other one is being loaded from, and you can get the number for loads here. There are several loads and several stored columns. I will not get too much into the details. And you can press D again on the offset and you will see all the guys responsible for touching this offset of the cache line. So again, you can see, now we can see the code address, code symbol, and the, actually, uh, the actual process uh, that touch, touch this uh, memory. So in this made up example, the solution to make it faster is to put the variables into separate cache line, actually only the, the other line is necessary, it would put the D to the separate cache line. And in the payhole, uh, payhole output, you can actually see now you have variable A separated from variable B with 64 bytes. So variable B will actually end up in the separate, separate cache line. More interesting example is uh, the scheduler speed up we were able to find with this feature. We have this benchmark uh, in perf, perf bench sked pipe, which actually creates a lot of processes, many processes, and those processes communicate to each other through the pipe. So it's actually a lot of scheduling. And uh, so anytime you make a change to the scheduler, it most likely will uh, appear at a speed up or not a speed up in, in this benchmark. So the data are recorded like this, perf C2C record and the benchmark. And what the report will look like, so you will get a lot of, a lot of cache lines because the data are were monitored like system wide, so all the memory accesses from the uh, from the system will end up in the data file. So again, you have uh, cache lines that were accessed, virtual address of the cache lines. If there's any luck, you will have the uh, translations of these cache lines into the variables, and then you will have you will have the access details for all the, all the cache lines. So actually, you monitor your workload and then you go through this output and try to find out the patterns of accessing. What helps is that for each cache line now, we, we actually got the call chains. So for each cache line, you can actually see uh, the pattern or the call chains, how, how actually they were accessed. Uh, for the issue I'm talking about, this cache line is interesting. If we press D, we will see details about this cache line and you can see it got accessed 
almost on uh, all, the, uh, all the offsets. But what is interesting here is that offset 8, 16, and 24 are being accessed only, accessed only for loading. You can see there were no stores, uh, no stores uh, recorded here. And from offset 32, uh, it's combination of the loads and the stores. So if you see something like this, it's kind of heads up that something like false sharing might be happening here. So you go for the first offset, and you will get the details about how the first offset was actually uh, was actually accessed. And the first column is code address. It's the it's the address that caused this event to actually generate a sample. So let's go and check the first one. I will copy the address. And Check the disassembly. You will find out that this address actually belongs uh, to this instruction, which is unwide of, of this macro. So, okay, let's go and check this macro. You can see this macro basically unbinds to this four cycle. And this four cycle only only uh, touches the parent parent uh, member of the scheduler entity structure. If you go to check for the skate entity, you will get uh, this this output. So this is the parent uh, that actually uh, that's where the sample is from. Then you have two other pointers, and then you have get average structure, which is convenient or which is which fits with what we uh, what we have here. Uh, we have first three uh, items, uh, eight byte pointers, uh, being just loaded, and the rest of the structure is the get average structure, and it is being written to. So on the picture, it looks like. It looks like this. Uh, the SCAT entity, together with SCAT average, is sharing the cache line. And this part is being read only, and the other part is write and also some, some, some reads. And if you split the cache line, if you put the SCAT average uh, into the separate cache line, uh, you will get actually speed up of 20 seconds during, this, uh, during the benchmark. So uh, it was very, very helpful. And it's a really small change and makes a big deal uh, in, in, the, in the scheduler and in the benchmark. Last example I have is. Not yet. Uh, OK, the other example is uh, about uh, running the same benchmark, but on the system that actually has the ftrace enabled, the function graph. The ftrace is um, basically the in-kernel tracing. So if you enable that, uh, it adds extra, extra work, uh, uh, extra tracing of the kernel kernel code into the, into the buffer file. So it adds extra overhead. It's not that big, but it is there. And you monitor, you monitor the uh, benchmark in the same way. And if you run the perf report, You will get the similar output. Again, the first column are cache lines. The other column is the data that got translated from this cache line. And the rest is the data that are associated, associated with the cache lines, like the excess data. So you go through all this data and, again, look for some patterns. 
I will make it quick and find the last one. Okay, this one. This is actually a cache line that uh, shares two variables. One is being one is being stored only, and the other one is being logged only. And if you go to the to the sources, you will see that the first variable is actually the lock, uh, which is guarding another uh, global variable. The lock is trace command line uh, underscore lock. The variable is safe command line. And they are saying uh, uh, they are sharing the same cache line. So while the lock is being read and written to, uh, this variable is only only being read. If we put them into the uh, separate cache lines, you will get the speed up of eight seconds. It's not much, but the the change is not big anyway. So. It's nice speed up for uh, two lines. Two lines change. This is the last example. The future uh, is the plan is to merge uh, the tool to the upstream as soon as possible because it's been there uh, too long, and not many people knows about it, and it can find like many issues uh, kind of quickly, and it has big impact on the on the performance. That's it. For me, if you have any questions. Sorry. Yeah, maybe it's the state of the uh, state of the tool. Sometimes the cache lines are from the stack, so there's no way you can translate them to uh, variables. And sometimes I don't know if the resolve code doesn't work good enough. Sometimes. The variable name is not there. You just, but you just get the disassembly of the of the VM Linux. Go there, and you need to find out which variable is being accessed. That's, that's how it is. Sorry. Uh, it depends if they are providing those load latency <coughs> events, which I'm not sure. If you can in virtual. Uh, machines, if you can use, depends if those events are available uh, in your in your guest. All the measurements were taken on the bare metal, like the not not virtual environment. Yeah. Uh, what happens when I when we uh, push those uh, changes to the kernel? You need to justify the case, and you need to persuade the developers that it actually makes the big big difference. So it's it's quite common, but you need to have the case. You need to really justify and show this is the best solution you can get for this for this issue. But from what I heard uh, from other like Joe Mario, they have many. Many places they put the cache line and got really big speed up, but they will never get to the kernel because it makes some key structures really big. So it will never get to the upstream, but it actually makes the difference in the performance. Uh, I forgot. Maybe like 20 or something, 20%. Sharing with uh, two CPUs, write to the same cache line, and uh, like if, the, if they not, if the other CPU does not read Z, but write to Z. Yeah, write is actually same as the load, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that you need to get the memory to the cache line, and then you write to it. So it's kind of, even if there is a write, it's considered to be uh, full sharing in this situation. And you will see a different kind of... Uh, right. You will not see the loads, but the stores again on the other guys. Yeah. Uh, this is 
Uh, the data I measured is most of the time on the Haswell, and this is this is actually the architecture we got best results from. Uh, it's it's on the Broadway and Skylake as well, but um, we don't get such a good data as from the Haswell. They are telling me I am out of time, so thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> the flash car? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Hi, Julian. Yes, yeah. Hi, I wanted to ask. Hi. Um, where can, uh, as a Red Hat employee, where can we get hold of the latest code so we can have a look at that new feature? I know you said it's not either. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes. It. It's on the on the Git tree. I show you, but the uh, just you know, you know, Joe Mario yeah. for the yeah. latest of this code. Just again, I need to load the load the slides and I will be back to you. My jsme ho mezi tím propůjčili některým přednášejícím, co chtěli, takže... A je to bude. Abychom asi spojili nějak s Martinem, no. Stejně jako ten tady, Martin tady prostě nechal nějaký blok. Asi ne, člověk. To bych nevěděl, než se vrátili. Jo, jo. V poslední době nějak se perfektor několikrát zpomaloval, a ještě jsem to neanalizoval, čím to je, ale je to strašně pomalu. Jo, je no. Je to. Vím o tom. Takže jste 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 I was just doing this for the presentation. I found this only because of the presentation. But most of the guys that are using this are actually trying to profile their applications. So they are actually looking from data from their applications. And, and you actually need to know the application. It's not like the tool will give you the answer to everything. You need to go to the cache line, to the code, and try to see how it fits with the, with the other guys. And it will just show you in the real terms where the issue is. Hello. Questions here? Okay, copy of the... Copy of the... Sorry, jury. Uh, we didn't have a... Sure.